Wow, it's rolling, but it's then I will, I will edit the first part of this, right? Yeah. So, all right, so then we're going to come in, mm -hmm. and it will be the skippy happy music. La, 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 la. And then it's going to come in, and then I will probably cut to, uh, I'm probably going to have to record. How yeah, that, that would help. Okay. All right, there's the recording. Test, test, check. Give me a test, Aspen. Test, test. There you go. All right, so how many episodes of your podcast do you have now? Four. Okay. It, I'm pushing through to the fifth. Okay, to the end you already have, what's the theme of the fifth? Is so it a spoiler alert? Yeah, so I can I can talk about it. So I have a coworker who's around the same age as me. Okay. And we actually have a serendipitous situation where we're pretty much like similar situations with our moms passing away. Okay. Which, I mean, is it like a fun thing to be like, hey, twins, but... Like, it helped us bond. Okay. And so we're going to talk about... She messaged me, actually, and she was like, I've been thinking a lot about, like, when someone will say something to me about, like, my mom, and it, like, makes me, like, uncomfortable, and, like, I feel like other people are uncomfortable when they, like, are approaching people who are grieving and they don't know what to say. So yeah. we're going to talk about kind of what to say or not to say, how to navigate those conversations. Okay, and, and already I have to say, and we're off. You already used the word serendipitous, which is a very big word, yes. right? But you are a college graduate. Uh, yes, I am. At a very young age. Yes. At 14. Close. Okay. Close. Right? It was actually 15. 15. And then I already love the way that you, you, you know, you hate twins. I mean, it's like where you talk about a pretty serious subject, but you, I don't know, you bring... Humor? Levity? Yes. And, and my guess is Aspen Drake, but I guess I've already done an intro where I've gone on and on about how mm -hmm. amazing you are, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you have a podcast called? Lost for Words. Lost for Words, and it is about grief and loss, and I've been listening to it, and I absolutely love it, and I recommend clients to listen to it. And, like, that's super flattering coming from the podcast general here. Oh, right? yeah, I think so, right? <laughs> yeah. I think the general, the commercial, like I got a little army hat on uh -huh. and a mustache, right? But so talk about that, bringing levity to a topic uh, grief and, or about grief and loss, right? Well, I think that's just kind of my MO as a person. Okay. And my family. You know me and my siblings pretty yeah. well and how we handle situations. And there's been a few situations that we've put into where it's one of those things where you can either cry or laugh and we take that second route and we're okay. just we roll with it we and sometimes it's one of those things that like you know you need to have moderation in all things because I think sometimes you know if you're too silly about stuff and just trying to it turns into kind of a denial phase okay and you don't really so there's Speaking that as well of phase you know, perfect segue so I asked Aspen to come on because she has an episode that I recommend that you go and listen to and it is about the five stages of grief and loss Yes. And you you presented that so well. I mean, I, I work with it in, uh, as a therapist now for a long time, and I feel like I learned a lot from you. Well, I appreciate. This is the second flattering moment already mm -hmm. in this And that is, podcast. I am tapped out. I, I do okay. two per show. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll take right? it. I'll so, take and before we get into the, the five stages of grief and loss, maybe do you mind kind of letting my listeners know a little bit about your story? E personally? Sure. Okay. So, I mean, I grew up normal childhood, pretty much, Northern California. Um, I have three younger siblings. I, my mom had breast cancer. Um, she got a double mastectomy. I was in elementary school, and that was kind of, that was hard. That do, was, do you remember a lot about that? I remember it being weird. I remember my mom coming home from the hospital and me being like, this isn't mom. Like, this mm. is weird. Something's different. But it was one of those things where, like, all the adults are trying to be like, oh, everything's happy. Everything's yeah. normal. But it definitely triggered something anxiety-related, I think. Okay. So since then, I've struggled with anxiety in different ways. And obviously, I think there's hereditary things that go into that. Sure. But I think that just going through that experience, I remember, you know, I was, I went into middle school and like I would go on field trips and my mom would have to chaperone because like I didn't want to be like away from her and oh, away okay. from home, like yeah. that kind of anxiety stuff. And so. Do you, do you look back now and tie that to that, her coming home from the hospital or do you feel like it was more, it was kind of there from the factory? Um, I think it was just kind of there from just the experience of her having cancer okay. and like having to realize from a young age like oh people can get sick oh something bad can happen um and then I think looking back I think subconsciously I didn't like it when my mom left like I knew there was like 
problems in the relationship there, marriage-wise. Okay. And so I didn't know it consciously then, but I think subconsciously when my mom would, like, leave with my dad, like, I didn't want to have a babysitter. I didn't want them to leave the house. Like, I needed to keep my eye on them. I needed to know, like, How old, like, what are you talking there? Is that middle school, high school? Uh, that was, like, elementary school, I think. And then going into middle school. Um, but yeah, high school, like... My mom's cancer had metastasized. I think that's how you say it. It's not a big word. Um, It's the fun time when the cancer didn't actually go away like you thought it did. It just spread. So Now, in those years, I mean, she had years, though, where she was Yeah, so she had years where she was cancer-free, and um, she went back to work. She was an elementary school teacher. Um, And she actually did work through and after most of her treatments. And so, yeah, she was very inspirational um but I mean I went to college and I remember being very anxious because when I was leaving for the for college that was the second time that my mom's cancer had come back and I was like I was signed up to go to school in Hawaii and that was a far ways away very rough place to go to school yeah other than other (laughs) than being separated from the family I didn't have much to complain about but yeah, it was... So did you find out about the, the that latest diagnosis your senior year, or was it... Yeah, so okay. senior year, and I remember mom was doing her thing where she's, like, trying to be strong and keep it from everyone, and I look in the back of the car one day, and there's, like, a folder from the hospital, and um, I'm like, Mom, are you kidding me? So did you already know? I mean, did you have a, a sense? Like, I felt like something was weird, but it wasn't, like, very evident. I was just like, oh, we must all be stressed out, because, like, it's, you know... Because talk about how, school did, year. how did your mom handle rough things oh she was a rock yeah she was she wouldn't let you know even if you try yeah, everything's fine everything's right? fine everything's great going yeah. about day to day and obviously i think that's why i'm kind of how i am with okay. my sure so you see that the the hospital info did you confront her or was it like oh man you know it was one of those things where like i think she was going to tell us soon anyways and she would set us set the siblings down and was like oh family meeting and all the kids know what that means and so they're all like dreading it uh-huh. um but my mom was like, you're going to school. If it's the last thing I do, I'm sending you off to school. And so I was like, fine. And I went. Mm. And I had a good time. And my mom was there to see me graduate. So that was very yeah. special to me because she was pretty much the whole reason I was there in the first place. Um, and it wasn't until I came home from school after I graduated that she started to get really sick in that third round of treatments. And it was just the few months that I was home. It was just such like a rapid just like descent in health and like. I'm happy that I was able to be there for her just yeah. because I eventually went to like a um, bereavement group and there was lots of other girls my age who had recently lost a like mother figure to cancer and a few of them didn't they weren't there when their mom passed away and they had a lot of like guilt and gotcha. emotions attached to that and I didn't realize that was like a big thing until I started meeting these girls and so it made me appreciate my experience a little bit more yeah okay yeah. So, it, what do you remember around that? What was that like, you know, after, immediately after, or those, yeah. It was just, well, first of all, being there in the room when someone is dying, like, mm-hmm. to put it in a very serious, literal context, is very bizarre. I don't think you are, you're not trained in life to have yeah. that kind of bedside manner. Like, when you're watching TV, and, like, someone dies in the hospital, it's very, like, they say their last words and they slip away quietly and it's just like very uh fades to black nice yeah music there's closure okay, sure yeah in real life it's like you know someone's body is actually shutting down so it's actually uh-huh. kind of like scary and it's kind of like you don't know when they're gonna pass and you kind of are hoping to just get it over with because yeah. it gets to a point where you're like okay like feeling yeah. um feeling kind of bad but i just can't do this anymore and um, I think like what you're saying unless you're a hospice nurse I mean how do you know what to do at all exactly and yeah. like we were like my mom was on hospice when that was happening she was at home and it was nice because we did have guidance and like uh-huh. they told us kind of what to expect and they gave us like some drugs just to kind of like ease that situation but it was just like do you I know this might seem too cliche but do you have thoughts or do you if somebody were to come to you especially as your podcast grows and you, I know you always ask for questions and feedback. If somebody asks you, hey, I'm, this is what I'm going through, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it. Like that end of life part, do, what would you say? Um, Like right before they pass? Yeah, yeah. Just be there. Like I remember the night before my mom passed, I had just kind of recently started a new job and I came home and I was kind of upset at something that had happened at work. And I spent 
like most of my night with her just talking about that and I remember looking back I felt so guilty because I was like I, I made my mom's last night about me but then if anyone kind of knew my mom and her I, I relationship I would say that's probably perfect for yeah, her yeah right? exactly yeah. I don't think she would have had it any other way no so, and matter of yeah. fact if you would have tried to make it about her that's oh, yeah. you're gonna exactly. get that exactly yeah exactly so yeah just being there and like because once that person's gone you've got a whole new like set of events you're going to be going through but that's inevitable you can put that off until like yeah. that person is gone and then so be, be present those. and just yeah. be, be there yeah. but do you remember the the week or so afterward what that was like or was that it you know was, the, the, the blur kind of you hear it about it was the blur um i was kind of saved from the long-term sense of shock just because as I just gave my, like, long history with my mom and her cancer, like, I think I had been preparing for a while sure. for her to pass. So yeah. it wasn't, like, this thing where it was, like, it wasn't real. It was just one of those things that, like, yeah, I'd say the first week it was a blur. It was kind of, like, it was a blur of people visiting and messaging and calling and me informing everyone and then trying to scrounge up all the information to get a funeral mm. and contacting the family. And it felt almost kind of like a little safe space because, like... You know, all your family starts flocking in, yeah. all the friends, everyone's there. You don't have to, like, worry about anything too logistical immediately. Everyone's just kind of concerned for your well-being, so there's kind of a safety net yeah. there. Can I tell you, I remember, because I, 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 I got to attend the funeral, and I still remember, you know, just the, my heart breaking, and I remember I, I watching then you guys all come in, the family come in, and I'll never forget that, you know, you're you're trying to look at your faces and it's like I'm expecting somber and do you remember what your you guys were smiling. Yeah. And it was like it was the I felt like everybody in, and it was packed, right? Yeah. And I felt like everybody there just kinda when they saw you guys come in and, and there's like smiling because it's like that that was your mom. Yeah. And and it was just that was just I think it set the whole tone. I think so too. And like that like the whole ease and the help that I've had since my mom passing and it's especially just symbolized through that is just who my mom was my mom set up this wonderful community for us everyone loved her she loved everyone she was very selfless and happy all the time and so I don't know she like helped us have this transition through her passing just by like having that community of good people surrounding sure. her yeah yeah um, okay, so, it, it, you know, I, I, I asked you to kind of come on and, and give your thoughts on the five stages of grief and loss, right? Yes. So I'm curious, is this a good place to transition into, were you living those? You know, what was yeah. your experience with those? What are the five stages okay. of grief and loss? All right, now so, it's time for you to drop some knowledge, okay, as the kids say, yes, right? Okay, yes, yes, this okay. is me. I'm going to sit back. Okay, so, um, basically, the very bottom line of the five stages of grief is, when I talked about it on my podcast, I had my sister on, actually. And we decided... She was so funny, by the way. She is so funny. Yeah. She's Big words, hoot. that sort of thing, yeah, too, right? Yeah, yeah, I good know. At that. Okay. She's, like, so great and so funny <laughs> and so... Hard. You hear that all the time, yeah. right? Okay. All right. Um, you know, the youngest sibling syndrome. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, sure. So, um, anyways, um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually is the one who kind of created this concept of the five stages of grief. And we wanted to talk about the five stages of grief because we figured everyone's at least heard of it before. Yeah, sure. Even if you don't really know what it is, like, I feel like it gets referenced a lot. And so it actually came around in, like, the late 60s, early 70s when Elizabeth wrote her book. It was inspired by a lot of work that she did with people who were terminally ill and facing the concept of passing away soon. And she kind of, like wrote down and studied like these emotions and these phases that people went through when they were like trying to grapple with the fact that they would their life would be ending soon okay um and so i mean since she published it it's been debated as most all things are in well, science that's what i did not know so i mean yeah talk about that it wasn't and didn't she say that her goal wasn't to have this what this... yeah so basically she had to come back and defend her writings and be like i didn't mean it to sound like this like these steps that you have to take like one after the other. If you do it wrong, if you don't do these in order, you're doing this wrong, yeah, and right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. She was like, these are just like a collection of things that could and most likely will be experienced through grief. It's not something where like you have to take, it's like a ladder going up yeah. to the next emotion to the next. Yeah, exactly. It's just kind of like some observations and she was like, you all just took this way too literally. Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. And any idea why? I mean, why did, the, why did everybody embrace that? 
I don't know. I don't know. I could look into the... It could be the formatting of the way she wrote it. Yeah. She could have wrote it in a chapter-by-chapter, step-by-step way that made it seem like it. Or it was just, you know, I think people in science and stuff like to like to nitpick and sure. be very blunt. Well, and I thought about it. I mean, as a therapist, I can't, t- I, I can't tell you. I will tell you. Mm-hmm. But I feel like um, it, it. people don't know what to do or how to grieve or the process. So I almost feel like people were gr- wanted to grasp onto anything tangible yes. that looked like, oh, okay, there's a way to do this. Yeah. Then followed up with that, of course, no, is the, And it's yeah. true, because you want to have that, like, safety net where it's like, this what is what you can expect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then I think the danger, then, is, uh, is maybe someone who then doesn't say, but your mileage may vary, right? Yeah, exactly. If it's like, wait a minute, you haven't mm-hmm. done, you know, so yeah. uh, can I show off with the acronym? Yes, please do. It's DABDA. Yes. So we got, uh, we got denial. Mm-hmm. We have uh, anger. Yes. Okay, we have bargaining. Yes. We have dancing. Th- that no. has happened in okay, the past right? two years. Okay, but no, it's depression. So, yes. I'm sorry, d- depression and then uh, acceptance. Yes. So, uh, now I made total sport of that, but so we've got what? Uh, denial, anger, bargaining, um, depression, and acceptance. Yes. Okay. So, do you talk about your experience with those? Or, I mean, or do you want to kind of go into where that comes from more? Yeah, I mean... Basically, we went through the stages and we talked about, like, our personal experiences. Because, as you said, it's going to vary from person to person. So, when we went into the talking about the different stages, we kind of got more personal and just talked about how we've experienced these stages. Okay. Um, so, what, we can do that. Yeah, I'd like. love for you, if you don't mind. I, mean, I still no. want people to go listen to your podcast, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I love, I love the, you guys did such a nice job with that. And, first of all, um, can we go ahead and throw out the cliche, but it is so true, Aspen Drake, is there a correct way to grieve? No. Thank you. And you will hear that a few Always. times in my podcast. Oh, and but a few it's times real. In everyone's. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because I do feel like that's like now. Yeah, I do. Well, and I say, like, in my podcast, the whole reason I went to, like, this grievance group that really helped me to, like, conceptualize a lot of stuff in the mm-hmm. first place was because, like, I didn't cry. That just wasn't, like, a physical reaction that I had to grief often. And so for me, I was like, this. There's something wrong with me. Absolutely. I don't like cry dramatically like in the movies. So okay. like I must be a robot or something. Okay. Yeah. Right. And other people are crying and you feel like there's judgment if I'm not yes. crying. Yes. And it's right. one of those things where it's like people who like don't even know my life are coming up to me and crying and they're like, this is so sad. And I was like, well, I'm glad someone's crying. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, kind of take us through those. Okay. So the first thing. Um, denial. Denial. So denial is kind of hard to have when you were there witnessing it. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? But I think denial can be like a subconscious thing where you just go about your day to day and you kind of push it to the back of your head. If you know, I ignore like, it, it'll go away. It's yeah, not real. Yeah. Okay. And that's kind of my uh, pilot mode. That's okay. kind of how I go into like, okay, you know, get up, go to work get chores done, like, do that daily, day-to-day grind, like, I live a normal life, and then one day I'm like, oh, oh, my, my mom's, one, like, I'll see, like, a mom with her daughter, and I'll be like, wow, that won't be me and my, like, mm. if I ever have a kid, they're not gonna have a grandma, like, that, like, it just explodes out of nowhere. Sure, okay. Yeah. So, like, I think denial can kind of get at you in that way. Yeah. Um, I was disappointed that you didn't do the denial is not a river in Egypt joke in your well, podcast. I saved it for you oh, to thank do you. right okay. now. Okay. I just did it. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank Congrats. You. Thank you. All right. So any more kind of thoughts around denial? I mean, I, I will say I have watched a lot of people when there is a diagnosis. I think the di- the denial part sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. I think the, the denial is very much the Thing that happens beforehand yeah. like like you said like someone's like this is something that's imminent and that's when you're like nah, no no nah. it's not or i mean i remember and, and not trying to compare anything but i had an uncle who was diagnosed and he, and he passed away within a few months yeah and i just remember that was like a uh, first thing we get it's like yeah but he's 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 uh he's strong he's yeah. vibrant he'll yeah. he'll get through it yeah right? we're fine exactly. right yeah and then every step of it it's like well they're doing a scan they found some stuff but it's probably not a big deal and well, you know and i think a lot of human nature is just trying to hold on to that yeah. trying to hold on if it's whether 
you call it hope or naivety or whatever sure. you want to call it. Like, I think we always want to try to be buoyant through yeah. these experiences. So I yeah, think it's so that's almost like our defense mechanisms. Yeah. But then we also have the the opposite of the person who's like, you know, goes worst case. And so we don't want to be that exactly. person either, right? That's yeah. the, the fan of WebMD, mm-hmm. you know? Oh my gosh, don't even get me started on the WebMD. Okay. But I think everyone knows. Yeah. Don't, I, I, don't look up yourself. Right, exactly, right? I, I do, there's a, I, I laugh sometimes with, uh, I have a lot of clients who are doctors, and that's one of my kind of rapport building. Yes, You know, yes. How, what's that like? And in my world, I have people all the time, like, okay, I am bipolar. You know, I'm like, okay, let's kind of talk about that, right? And I'm like, well, sometimes I get a little angry, sometimes I get a little sad. You know, uh, sometimes I get a little happy. I'm like, well, sounds like you got it figured out, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, WebMD, anyway. So, yeah, I could go on with that, too. But, um, denial. Yeah, so after that, anger. Were you? I can't picture an angry Aspen Drake. You were correct. Did you skip that one? That's not a... Then you did it incorrect. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. I did it. I did the stage strong <laughs> because I'm not a very angry person. No, you're not. So, right. Did you have any of that? Um, I do periodically... So here, this is how I'm going to like frame all the stages okay. for us now. Have you ever watched like a movie or like a TV show and these people are going through like these brambles, this forest, and then they see like a sign pointing and they're like, oh, it says go that way. So they keep going for like a few hours and then they come back into a clearing and they see the sign again. They're like, I was just here. Okay. Can I just tell you? And I don't want to, I know I don't want us to go on forever, but, um, my, one of my very first hundred mile race I ever ran in my entire life, Mm -hmm. um, 72, 73 miles in where it's the middle of the night and I'm running with this German guy named Teo Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm pretty whooped at that point. Yeah. And we see this uh, swing set, and I say, and I'm trying to do anything I can to just keep going. And I go, my kids would really like to play on that swing set. And then we go down a hill, and we jump, and whatever, and we come up and around, and there's a swing set. And I'm like, man, my kids would really like to play on that swing set. And, you know, three times I yeah. do that. So I know you just triggered so this me. This is a yes. very real, yeah. like, definition for you. Yeah. This is what going through the stages is like for me. Ah, I love it. I feel like, you know, I'll get to that clearing, and I'm like, okay, like, I'm really facing this now. Like, I feel like it's getting, like, this is real, and I've uncovered, like, this emotion. I understand it now. And then I'm like, okay, the arrow says go that way. And so I keep going. And then, like, a week later, I come back in the clearing. I was like, I was just here. I was literally just here. Where is the progress? Right, that's good. That yeah. yeah. So when we talk about, like, the anger thing, it's like, it's a periodic thing. Sometimes it comes up. Something will trigger it. Like, um, so it isn't just, you know, I think a lot of people say, I, I'm angry at God or something like that. So there are people who are like that. I'm not, apparently, I'm not philosophical enough. I don't know if I'm just not large-minded enough to get mad at, like, a larger figure. I am just kind of get little scenarios. So, yeah, that's a thing that is described as being in the anger thing. Not really in my forte. Sure. But, but, so are you kind of saying, though, that my kids will never have a grandma thing is that that can bring anger? Yeah, stuff okay. like that. Or um, this past week was my mom's best friend's birthday. Mm-hmm. So I messaged her and I was like, hey, happy birthday. Hope things are going good. Checking in with her. And she sent me, she checked back in and she sent me this picture of um, she and my mom were like best friends, like in like high school. Mm-hmm. And so she showed me this like excerpt from this thing they both wrote and I read my mom's and like it was just so funny and charming and silly and like I started thinking about how like you know my mom was just so full of life and so charismatic and she touched so many people's lives and like a lot of the time that I knew her I think between like having four kids and a problematic marriage and being sick and working I think that took a lot of the life out of her sometimes and she was still wonderful and charming always but I just like I don't know I got angry that she's not here to keep expanding that and to keep like fulfilling her potential in that realm and okay. I don't get to experience that personally anymore so that made me mad okay. but I'm not a very angry person so that righteous indignation that gives me like that boost of energy to like rage against the machine will slowly just wilt into this like oh I'm just sad now okay all right so could you quickly move there then, yes right? okay. yes um and I I didn't even have you, any other thoughts around anger from like where Elizabeth Kubler Ross was going or or do you feel like we kind of covered that um Let's see in my notes. Yeah. So there's also like self like frustration, like why me? Like okay. why is this happening to me? Okay. Either like you're you're the one who got sick and you're like, you know, I don't deserve this or like someone you know has passed away and you're like you know. Yeah. So yeah. There's God, there's why me. 
that's pretty much there's even when you can be mad at the person who passed okay. you can be like why did you do this yeah. to me why did you put this in me in this situation or like why didn't you do this while you were still here? And I feel like that's a hard one to reconcile because it's like, it's a one-sided battle. I, well, all of these anger things are pretty much a one-sided battle. Sure. I don't yeah. think you can put on the boxing gloves with God or something, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, next, bargaining. Bargaining. And I, and I, re I remember this. Uh, I was actually up in, uh, I think, Calabasas at a basketball tournament walking the streets um, going to get a sandwich at Subway, listening to you guys. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly where I was with the bargaining because this is where I learned some things, right? Okay. So talk about bargaining. Okay, so bargaining is like it sounds. It's negotiating. And so some people, if you find out you're sick, some people will like negotiate beforehand and be like, oh, well, I'll be better now if I can be healed. Like negotiating with God, negotiating with like your morals and ethics and karma and just being like, oh, what do I do to change the situation? You know, you're like scrambling. It's kind of like, you know, your survival instinct. You're like, yeah, you're trying, you're avoiding that realistically. There probably isn't much you can do. Okay. But this is like your last dash effort of being like, what if, and also like after someone's passed the, the bargaining, it does kind of like a backward negotiation. This it's, is what was new to me. Okay. Yeah. So this is like a, if only this had happened, yeah. would we get this result? If only we had like gone to the doctor like a few months earlier, would they have like caught it and then this person would still be here? And I feel like that's just torturous because yeah. you can run around in circles with what ifs all the time and it doesn't change. This doesn't anything. sound very empathetic, but I, and a lot of times I'm, when I'm trying to work with change in the relationship people have with their thoughts, whether it's through mindfulness, that sort of thing, I just have the, is that a productive thought? Yes. Thought, right? Yeah. And that one's a tough, it's not, right? No, it's yeah. not. And that's not a matter of not being empathetic because you're not getting in someone's face and being like, yeah, cut it out. Yeah. I think it's just like, it's realistic. You can torture yourself over this stuff or you can. Oh, and I see, and so that's the one I see in therapy. I think that's why it was such an epiphany to me of not recognizing that as part of the bargaining phase where I have people all the time that yeah. if only I would have done this, this, and this. And sometimes people can create this whole, I mean, they go back yeah. years. You yeah. Know? And guilt is a very strong thing that I think is associated with grieving a lot uh -huh. and I think this is a stage where guilt comes in because people do that very thing and yeah. so they are taking it all on themselves being like oh you know like if only I'd done this and then you start thinking about like I wish I had a better relationship with this person or I wish I would have done this earlier you know I, I have a couple of my kids got in a car wreck they a lady ran a red light and it and it was man one of the most terrifying days of my life yeah. And they will still at times talk about, you know, these, I was doing my homework and if I would have just done this or if I would have, you know, and it's like, man, I see how hard that or how easy I guess that is to mm -hmm. just jump right into there. So I can't even imagine if it's something to do with somebody who had passed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's next? Dancing? Uh, yes. Okay. Dancing um, your depression away. Okay. Um, so depression I think is when the guilt that you might have fostered in other stages kind of really gets you. And so you can either like, you know, face that guilt, but that's just exhausting. Okay. So you just kind of lay down and you take a little <laughs> depression nap, okay. which is what I like to do regularly. Okay. Yes. So, uh, but the depression is kind of, according to this uh, model, depression is kind of what helps lead us to acceptance because you're depressed because you're finally facing the music and being like okay this is real i okay. can't work my way out of this you anger's know? not getting me anywhere sad. i can't bargain myself mm -hmm. through it right okay yeah um so what do you what, what was your experience like with depression depression was well for me it's like i'm not new to depression i think i've experienced depression from a non-grief related space okay and so it's one of those things where like when it was happening like when I was like sad or like chronically tired mm. or um just feeling not made it motivated to do things like after my mom had passed I was like kind of like well this is I've been here and now there's like an actual reason behind it so I can be a little more like forgiving with myself I guess and okay. kind of just let this a little bit of a hello old friend right? yes yes and, um, but but not gonna stay as long this time yeah probably. exactly um what what were do you remember what were there things that were able to kind of get you out of a depressed state are there tools that you have um I think 
I mean, this probably isn't like a good tool, but I think guilt is a good one to nip that in the butt. I think me being the oldest, uh-huh. it is a very strong dynamic for me to be like, okay, well, I can't just sit here and do gotcha. nothing because I've got three little siblings who are probably feeling the same way and got to put on the face, much like my mom always right, did. Right, I that. Yeah, yeah very okay. inherited. So, um, yeah, got to go, like, represent the family and, like, make sure everyone on the outside kind of peeking in knows we're, like, functioning, we're getting stuff done. and Yeah. Um, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, at what point did you start going to a group? And what was that experience like? Because I, I, I thought that was powerful, too. It, it, it was. It was, like, a very short, in the grand scheme of things, it was a short time, but it was very powerful. I went, it was probably, like, I started considering it about six months after my mom had passed away. I don't remember when I started, but I think that's when I, like, was like, okay, maybe I should look into this. Um, and, yeah, I enrolled, and there was hospice groups in our area, but all the groups were for, like, elderly people. Because that's oh. just kind of the, yeah. uh, the the majority up there. So I actually ended up driving down to Davis once a week. Oh, that's and pretty, there was, pretty far. Yeah. yeah you committed. I was. I was like, I'm doing this for me. This is my one, like two hours a week where I can just sit with my thoughts and my emotions. Okay. Was there, were you hesitant to, I mean, I find that there, there are times where people say I should probably do that, but then they don't. No, I don't think I was hesitant because it was one of those things where I'd hit the wall and it's like, I, I, I went like right back to work after my mom passed away. And that's when it was like, I just started going back into the routine and like numbing myself and just being like, okay, go to work, get stuff done. Mm. Um, I wasn't crying a lot. I wasn't really thinking about anything outside of like my zone. And so that's when I was like, okay, I need to do this because it's just not healthy. Like I think it would be liberating to be able to acknowledge these feelings and emotions okay. and I need help okay so so you go down to Davis so I go down to yeah. Davis and it was very cool because like I had mentioned it was this group they were all girls they were all around my age and they were all affected by having lost a mother figure to cancer wow. and this was a group that was for any gender within like the ages of like 18 to like late 20s and it could have been like any kind of loss it didn't have to be like from sickness or anything so like oh, okay. our group leader like pointed out the first day he was like this is a very interestingly unique group because you all seem to be like have a very specific thing going on so we can dig into like more oh, specific so topics. it could have been anything but yours yeah okay. yeah exactly so that's what made it kind of cool um but yeah it was kind of like an art therapy group where the first hour we would talk about just kind of like theories behind like um grieving and you know that's where I learned it's okay to like not cry or cry or lay in bed or go to the movies like you know sure so and then the second hour was art so we would do like an art project okay what kind of stuff did you so we made one day they laid out a bunch of magazines and they said to like make a collage that like reminds you of your loved one or that you you know, something that you, they'd like, or that they would make, or that reminds you of, like, there wasn't any, like, restrictions, it was art, but, like, yeah, I liked it, I was, like, going back to, like, preschool, like, cutting out my pictures, yeah, Yeah, it was, it was awesome, I think people need to art more often, okay, um, but, yeah, we did that, and then the last one we did was, like, we, like, played with, like, clay, like, play-doh, and then they, uh, they, they put it in the, what's it called? The little burner, the furnace thing for oh, us. It was like a kiln. kiln. Yes. Yeah, okay. So. I wanted to say easy bake oven. Right? <laughs> no, yeah, it was a kiln. little more professional. Okay, fair. But it was interesting because the, the, the mask that I made, like we all made masks and they're like, we want you to like show your emotions through this mask and like it can be a subconscious. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I like made little like, um, eyes and a nose for a face because that's the only thing I can do with facial structure that's it but I got very ambitious and I was like oh I think I want to make like a little brain on the head and like paint it different like colors so it's like artsy like it's all the thoughts and emotions flowing through the head so anyways when I bring it home I show my siblings I was like hey look at this and they're like hey it's mom and I was like no it's not and they're like yeah it is she always wore those like knitted hats and I was like oh my gosh I made my mom okay that's pretty cool and that's what they talked about in the class just lots of like subconscious stuff that we don't really address verbally but if we do it through art it can kind of come out come out okay perfect 
Um, so then did that then start moving you into acceptance at that point, do you feel like? For me, it's kind of like acceptance is a very weird thing to like have as a stage. Okay. Because I can't imagine ever like yeah. having this like epiphany moment where you like walk out into like the light and you're like, I understand the circle of life and all things yeah, and I, I accept it, I everything. Done with all worries and yeah. fears. And, yeah. I feel like the closest you're going to get to acceptance is when you kind of realize like, like everything, I think everyone has different bars, like different stages where they can say, oh, this feels better. Mm -hmm. This feels like more acceptance related. But it's like, I think as long as you're like feeling better than you were before, okay. even just a little bit, I think that's like a step of acceptance. I like that. I think it's just a continual, like okay. you can feel, but yeah, I don't think there's ever going to be a time where you're like 30 years later and you're like, I'm okay with this. This was a good thing. You know? Yeah, I do. I, you know, I had a, a brother pass away 20 something years ago and his birthday would have been yesterday. And mm -hmm. it's like, you still have those times, right? I gave a little thought to, eh, you know, it would have been nice. What would we have been like as an uncle? Would my kids have played yeah. with them? That sort of mm -hmm. thing. And, yeah. But then it's like, you know, I'm kind of, I'm okay. I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't have as much of a sting. Exactly. And like I said, everyone has like going to have different levels. So like for me, it's like, I don't have that milestone where I'm like, oh, I can like talk about it without crying now. Mm. Because like that wasn't a problem for me before. But yeah. I'm sure for other people, that would be like a really big milestone. Sure. So. Did you ever have a moment where the tears did come? And unexpectedly? Yeah. yeah. What, for me, it's like, I have to like, I have to like practice the, well, first of all, I think tears just build up. I get like stressed and I'm holding everything back for so long. And then one day I'm like, oh, that's it. This okay. is the day, like it's coming. So I think I have that. But also beyond that, I really have to like, have a concentrated effort. Okay. At, like acknowledging my feelings so I mentioned in some of my podcasts that I like writing because yeah. that helps me really dig into my memories and my thoughts and my feelings and now podcasting is another way that I can kind of like untangle the thoughts in my head and like get it out verbally okay so. um do you you talked about a couple of things uh was that the same episode where you talked about the like the the cultural part where you were kind of paying homage to your mom do you know what i'm talking about oh uh, yeah what was that yeah. about yeah okay so um there's a were you talking about the little like fair that i went yeah, to the first, yeah yeah so there's some fairgrounds by where i live and they put on an event every year and it's i can't for the life of me remember the name okay but it's just where people in the community make like little shrines or okay. homages yeah. or like for like people who have passed away, like specific people in their family, or for like groups of people, or just to like memor memor mem memorialize. memorialize. Thank you. That was a tongue a twister. Yeah. Um, just kind of like a concept or like a. So you know, I went there, and that was like, when you think about death or like, you just think about going to a funeral, mm -hmm. and then you go through the 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 motions with that, and then you leave, and you wipe off your hands and you're done like yeah. death isn't that it, it's not anymore you don't think about it anymore but this was cool because it was kind of like a play on dia de los muertos without okay. being like appropriation -y, you know and where people just kind of were able to present their family members and present like things that were important to them and memorialize them okay in like a way that was like personal but also other people could come and enjoy it and everyone can just like share in this like you know, we're accepting that this is a thing. And it really is a celebration then of yeah, those it's, who have passed. It's artistic. Everyone has their own different take on it. Yeah. It's not like sad or like having to hide it away so you don't make other people uncomfortable. That, and I think that's what, yeah, is that maybe just a, an American cultural thing for the most part? The, it, we, we're not going to talk about it anymore. It right? might be. I think we just don't like uncomfortable topics unless it's edgy okay. there's some people who are like they love uncomfortable sure. topics but it's never something that's actually like yeah so did you create one of those at that or did you just kind of go no and, so okay. i went and i observed and i want to create one next year okay. so i'm going to contact them and be like hey can i have a booth this year yeah i think that'd be fun. so i have not i'm not caught up on the latest disney movies but apparently though there was one recently about death coco coco yes right. it was very good okay I went per Brighton's, my little sister's recommendation, and it was just, first of all, animation was incredible. Okay. Um, and you probably heard that because I think it got some awards. But beyond that, it was just very nice because I don't think kids are given lots of avenues to yes. think about their family members passing on and what happens after that. And so this was very much based on, like, Dia de los Muertos and the beliefs around that. And it was very just, like, 
cute Disney Pixar wholesome fun where he crosses over accidentally and he sees his old oh. family members who had passed and he like they're trying to help him get back and stuff like that. I like that the concept is though we need to kind of start talking about it, right? Yes, and I just think it's cool that they can kind of give children a vocabulary and a way to conceptualize it. Like even if that's not like something you believe about the afterlife, mm. there's got to be something, some sort of conversation where like kids can be like, okay, well people do leave the earth, you know. Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. and that kind of goes back. My my whole soapbox is. Uh, don't like fix or judge somebody when they are trying to put something out there. And I yes. feel like there's kind of this underlying theme of if, if somebody wants to talk about death or, or what happens or somebody's died and, and if the parent isn't comfortable, they're going to shut that down. Yes, right? exactly. And I think when that does come from a, a child, I think it can be intimidating because you don't know what to say. Yeah. And so I think the shutting it down can be like seen from the kid as like, oh, this is bad. This right. Is we scary. don't talk about it. Right. So then we if they have feelings that. around it, then they, we don't say anything. Right. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of the things we have about death is scary because, you know, we love Halloween. We love scary movies. Yeah. We love like gruesome murder stories so like that gets publicized everywhere that side of death but i don't think as much as like the actual physical metaphysical spiritual side of yeah i, I just i haven't talked about this on any podcast but um the town that i live in last year we had a, a a very beloved football coach um pass away on the field during a practice where there were tons and tons of kids yeah. um coach morales and he and he was uh so they, they asked me to come talk to all of the kids, the parents, the cheerleaders, and I thought that that, that football board did such a nice job of, you know, they, they wanted to write then because a lot of kids had questions or they, they didn't even know what they saw. Mm -hmm. And they and, and I remember I was speaking to that group and it was kind of going through this, hey, it's okay, it's okay if you're sad, it's okay if you're not, it's okay if you you knew him, it's okay if you didn't, and it was, I just thought that was, that was huge, yes. and they, the, they had, um, had, there was all the chaplains from all these various churches there, and, and, uh, but I thought, okay, that was a super positive thing to do, mm -hmm. instead of just like, hey, you know, uh, this, a lot of the kids don't know about it, so let's yeah. kind of keep it quiet, right? No, and, and that's so, great. yeah, so I just thought that was like more toward, let's, let's kind of give it a voice, and, no, and that's super awesome. And I know it just seems weird and open-ended to be like, oh, you can feel anything. Right, yeah. And it's okay. Like, I don't think that's usually the answer we have for things, and yeah. so it feels weird to say that. But, like, that's kind of the safest bet we have when we're addressing, like, a big group of people, because I feel like everyone's going to have a different relationship with this person. Yeah, and I have to tell you, as the guy, way. like, presenting it and looking out, there were little kids, big kids, and, and you saw every... Um, look under it there were some people that were completely tuned out there were people that were just weeping there were mm -hmm. people that were i mean it was it was yeah. i mean that that whole range of emotions you kind of see it right yeah. there and i know that people were looking at other people thinking okay i'm not I yeah yeah this? so yeah. but i thought that was really healthy to kind of put that out yes there, right um okay tell me in it, it, so i really like that concept of that acceptance even i feel like um i think some people struggle with that where they feel like if i haven't become good with death or then something's wrong yeah. so I like your idea of maybe just a little bit of mm -hmm. progress around that yeah. and that'll look different right yeah um any other thoughts around the five stages Elizabeth Kubler Ross yes did she go on to do anything else I don't remember um I know I was reading her Wikipedia I was vetting it just making sure I was giving her like her good graces yeah and I wasn't just like throwing her name around and I know she went on to study with more concepts like this um oh actually she went on Hold on, let me check my she went notes on Jeopardy? real quick. Like, like, pause there. <laughs> that yeah. would have been pretty cool. Yeah. Um, she probably would have done really well. Uh, so she uh, went and I think she taught because she decided that there was a lack of instruction in the medical field around the actual concept of death and dying. Oh, okay. They just learned about, you know, how to prevent death and dying. But I think she wanted to teach people how to communicate about it better. And I think... I read where like her talking about the communication to professionals and people training to be professionals helped usher in like the importance of just communicating with the patient, communicating with the family, having like that bedside manner. Okay. Um, cause yeah, I feel like, you know, when you're busy studying like your science textbooks all day, you might become a little like a little clinical. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I will tell you the I do feel like the five stages of grief and loss from a therapist standpoint have started to make their way into other things. So people are grieving um, relationships or yes. grieving, you know, I always thought I would, through divorce. It's like mm -hmm. I always thought I would have this or, yeah. 
And so sometimes we can apply those there too. Yeah, yeah. And this, yeah, this definitely isn't specific to death. It can be like losing a job, you know, just losing something that was a big part of your life, I think, amounts in some sort of... I think you can reaction. even do it with losing keys. I just worked these through, right? Yes. Denial? No, mm-hmm. I'll find them. Anger? Yes. Really? Again? Bargaining? It's like, okay, come on. I gotta go. If I can just find these, right? Depression. Depression. Why like, oh I my gosh. This. I was like, fine. Uh, you know, it's no big deal. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that is when you find the keys. Mm-hmm. Right? Every time. And they're in the fridge. In the fridge? <laughs> I've never had keys in the fridge. I had a phone in the fridge once. Okay. That's, uh... I feel like I wish that we just like ended it right there. <laughs> Had a phone in the fridge once. Um, all right, anything uh, more kind of to, to share about? Where do you want to go with your podcast? I mean, you're it's new. It's I really love it. Yes, it's very a uh, self starter. Okay. Um, it's very like I definitely have had the. Uh, self-sabotage stuff that I'm trying what? to put behind me that the imposter syndrome like you talked about where I'm like oh I'm not a real podcaster <laughs> right yeah um so. Basically, I listen to podcasts, and I love them very much, and I very much uh, admire the people behind the podcasts, and so I'm like, and I've always wanted to kind of, I like storytelling, Mm -hmm. I like sharing my experiences, because I feel like I've had some, some experiences, Yeah, and I like just being able to have fun and joke around and meet other people and talk to other people and just have a space to do that, so... Um, out of all the like media types that are out there right now, I just felt like podcasting was one that seemed interesting and I was kind of bonding with it lately. So I just went for it. Where will it go? I don't know. I would be super honored and flattered and it would be my dream if it went to a place where, you know, I could continue and I can make a little community for people who, you know, are experiencing grief or loss or just want to have a space to understand that if they aren't, um, uh, if I move on to other podcasts, that's that's farther on. No, in the future, yeah, I get you. Like, but I like that you want to, yeah, you want to start getting more uh, dialogue around this. Yeah, topic. just give it a space because I feel like you know there are spaces, there are people talking about grief and loss, but like I said, people's experiences are different, so different people are going to gravitate towards the different mm-hmm. communities that are kind of talking about it. Well, I, I will have you back to talk. I want to talk about what it was like to live in Hawaii, right? Yes, I, think I can fun. talk about that. Do you have a quick, cool story, like uh, something crazy? I have like an anecdote. Let's hear an anecdote. So, going to school in Hawaii sounds like this magical, wonderful thing. Yeah. But it's this constant life of like stress and guilt because you're at the beach and you're like, oh no. I should be doing homework. <laughs> and then you're doing homework and you're like, oh no, I should be out enjoying the beach and enjoying the how long am I going to be in Hawaii, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay. And so you're constantly going through that cycle and it's wonderful and it's worth it, but just be warned, that's okay. the life you're signing up for. Did you ever uh, hula? Yes. I took a hula class at the school. Nice. It was very fun. Okay. And I kind of wanted to do it again, but I think Sacramento does have some options. So. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. So will you come back on? To talk about, like, I would be honored. All right. Hopefully, people download this. Oh yeah, I, that was like, yeah. So where do you where do you find your podcast? Okay, so my podcast, Lost for Words, it is on iTunes. It is on Android stuff. Wherever you podcast, it's on or iTunes. Find, if you don't have iTunes, then get yeah. with the time. Yeah, oh, easy now. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh um, yeah. And but then, so and then you you have I, a Facebook group. I have a Facebook group. If you want to look that up, I have a personal Instagram. It's called Please Be More Pacific. <laughs> I made that when I was a client. I thought I was very clever. But yeah, I post about the podcast there, and okay. I make personal posts about my mom. So if you want to nice. kind of peep into that life, that's there. Okay, so. perfect. All right, so I would encourage everybody, Lost for Words. Uh, my guest, Aspen Drake, we will have you back. Yes, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, we never even looked at the camera once, Thank did we? you. Um, I super appreciate... I appreciate you having me on. You bet. Because it's Couldn't a wonderful wait. podcast. Literally, I've been begging you to come on. That's why I think yes. it's funny. I, 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 you know, I'd be like, you know, I don't know, kind of busy. Well, and then I brought up, the, like, the imposter syndrome. You'd text me, and I'd be like, oh, he just, like, feels bad for me, and he wants to oh, follow up so on funny. his request. Okay, and, so like, really, I'm like, you know, I'll record this one, but I don't think it's going to make the air. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm going to lose this file accidentally. It happens. <laughs> Okay. All right. Astro Drake, thank you very much for being thank on the virtual you. couch. Oh, I didn't know we were shaking hands. We're shaking hands. Left handed, like the scouts. Office. There you go. All right. We'll see you next time. <laughs> yes. Thank okay. you. Thanks. That was dope. We did it. Right?